Hello and welcome back to the School for Writers podcast. This is an episode that I am personally extremely proud of. Just like so good. I just if you if you're watching the YouTube video, I'm shaking. I'm so excited. I, there's so much energy and excitement over this because Paige is a participant in my Write Your Friggin' Book Already program. Paige is an American writer living in Geneva, Switzerland, who's always loved the printed word, beginning with her first job of writing obituaries in the obituary department, a local newspaper where she grew up in Bakersfield, California. Pretty amazing, right? Writing obituaries, I love that. Later, she worked as an investigative journalist in Washington, DC. Paige joined Write Your Friggin' Book Already, my program, or WIFBA, as we call it around here, in 2020 at an arguably, in her words, arguably terrible moment to begin writing a novel. <laughs> We're at the beginning of pandemic. It was two months into the Swiss COVID lockdown, and she was caring for a baby and a toddler in a very small apartment. Paige says that despite the logistics, she felt herself being called to join this program and to write her friggin' book already. She said that she, quote, needed to write this novel for her sanity. Ooh, I know that feeling. Nine months later, just nine months later, she's on the fourth draft of her novel. We just workshopped her novel and it is amazing. It is such an amazing novel just nine months later during a pandemic with kids in a foreign country, all of this. Her book, currently titled The Valley Between Us, I don't know if that title will change once it comes out, but I love that title right now, takes place in 1960s Switzerland and 1990s California. It's a beautiful, beautiful book. The reason I brought Paige on is not to promote the book. Unfortunately, it's not quite out in the world yet. But to talk with her about how she did this amazing thing of writing a novel during a pandemic with a toddler and a baby in a small apartment in a foreign country. That's an amazing feat. And I've been so completely honored to have her in the Write Your Friggin' Book Already program. I would love to share with you all now, and I'm so excited to share with you all now, Paige's insight and wisdom on how she wrote a book during a pandemic. Enjoy the episode. Have you ever walked into a bookstore and imagined seeing your book on display on the shelves? Have you ever dreamt of going over and touching it, of picking it up and telling the person next to you, hey, that's me, I'm the author. Maybe that dream propelled you to sit down and write a few sentences or even a few chapters of your book. But then, if you're like me, the idea of writing a book just started to feel so overwhelming and impossible that you gave up. Maybe you even quit calling yourself a writer. Maybe you even quit writing. Is this you? Does this feel all too familiar? That was me. For decades, I dreamt of holding a book in my hands, of my book in my hands. I went to school to learn to write. I attended conferences for writers, and I would meet agents and published authors and promise myself that I would finally sit my butt in that chair and finish my book. I was not alone in this. Everywhere I went, I met people who just like me wanted to write a book, but every time they sat down to do it, they just got completely overwhelmed with the process. And you, you're not alone in this either. The human brain, it cannot fathom accomplishing such a massive task as writing a book. We can dream about it, we can vision it, but when we go to do it, to actually do it, we need a step-by-step -step guide to show us how. You can only climb a mountain taking a single step at a time. That same is true for writing a book. It worked so well for me that I started teaching it to other people. I took everything that I needed and put it all together in a program to help you write your book. We've got group coaching. We've got small pot accountability. We've got peers on the road with you cheering you on when you stumble. And most importantly, we've got a proven roadmap for success with 95% of our participants having a readable draft of their book by the end of the program and a 100% satisfaction rate. That's amazing, right? Because there's heart and soul and love put into every part of this program because I made it for me first and now I have it out in the world for you. That dream of yours, that's my dream too. 
I want to walk into a bookstore and see your book on the shelf. And I want to think, hey, I helped this author write this book right here. Yeah, I helped her. That is the goal of Write Your Freaking Book Already, to get you to that dream of published author. If this sounds amazing and wonderful and perfect and great and fabulous to you, like it does to me and the people that are in the program, then you are the right fit. And I want you to apply to write your friggin' book already. Applications are only open once a year and spots are very limited. This is a deluxe intimate program, so we limit how many people can be in the program. We close the doors on March 5th, and I would really hate for you to have to wait another year to see that book of yours on the shelf. I don't wanna wait another year to read your book. I want you to apply today to writeyourfrigginbookalready.com because the world needs your story now more than ever, and because I cannot wait to walk into a bookstore and see your book. Apply today at writeyourfrigginbookalready.com. Hi, Paige. I'm super excited about this. Um, I think the hardest thing about this conversation with you, for me at least, is going to be that your book's not out yet. We're talking about a work in progress, which is really exciting because I think people need to see the work in progress part. But also, I want every, I've gotten to read this book and I want every person I know to read this book. And it's so, so good. And I'm super excited to talk about it with you. So why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are in this world? My name is Paige Bashik, and I'm a Californian like you, Lauren, but I live in Geneva, Switzerland. I've lived here for six years, and I uh, lost my job when my husband and I moved here. We moved here for his job as a journalist, and I spent a lot of years soul searching. I became a parent to two boys, and in 2020, I said I just have to write this novel that I've been thinking about. I love it. I um, What made you think, hey, it's a pandemic. Maybe this is a, time, a good time to write a novel. Like, how did you decide? Was that, did that push you to want to write it? Did that push you to not want to write it? Or did that, did you sign up before you even realized how huge of a deal it was going to be? I, I definitely think I was one of your more reluctant students. Um, since uh, I think I only officially signed up 24 hours before it started the program, I was really dragging my heels because it didn't make sense. This is not the right time. We don't have childcare where the kids are all over us. I'm, you know, feeling a lot of mentally, emotionally heavy feelings, but um, something just told me that I had to pursue this. I had to do something for myself, something creative, something nurturing. Writing is my therapy. And um, so I decided to give it a shot. I love, for those who are not watching the YouTube, I decided to give it a shot. Paige had this like, ooh, excited, nervous look on her face at that time. And I feel like um, for those who don't remember from the intro, pages in my Write Your Friggin' Book Already program. And I feel like everybody who started, I launched this and then a pandemic came. And everybody who started, it was like, we started a month into the pandemic. And that was a really scary time for people to decide to commit to this thing. But I think what you just said, there's such beauty in deciding, even in the chaos of life, I'm going to make room for my dreams. And I would love to know what kind of writing had you done up until that point, up until this program? Uh, so I studied creative writing in college and I loved it, but, and then I went to grad school and I studied literature and writing more, but then I got out of school and I needed to make rent. So I took any writing job available. I became a reporter for a local newspaper outside of DC writing on high school football and crime, you know, murder scenes and all different kinds of things that were really incredible. And I was a journalist for seven years, I think, before we moved to Switzerland. And it was a really fast paced lifestyle, you know, fast deadlines, breaking news, mean editors. And um, that gave me the skills to write really quickly and not think about it too much, which I'm I, I love that I have that, but um, it wasn't fulfilling in, in like a soulful life purpose way. 
And um, when I looked back at the writing that I've done, what I was working on in college, creating my own world, writing fiction was um, the happiest I've been, the most fulfilled I've been. And when we moved abroad, I kept doing little freelance things. I started a blog. A lot of people have blogs, but I just thought I was going to write a novel at some point. <laughs> and then I woke up and I was 35 and I hadn't written a single page. Mm. I can relate to that so much. Like you have this dream and you assume you're going to do it at a certain age or by a certain time. And then all of a sudden that age comes and you're like, holy crap, I haven't done that yet. Maybe I should get on that. So I'm glad that you got on that. Um, I have so many questions from what you just said, because I love your background. I love that. I think that we all have this idea that if we go off to school to be a writer, then we will write our novel or then we'll, we can be a writer and we can call ourselves a writer. And yet life still happens even to people who are professionally trained writers and we don't, we don't end up doing that thing we want to do. So um, I want to know what it was like as a journalist. Did that, like, what was what you, one of the things you mentioned that I thought was really interesting was mean editors. I have that idea from when I was in um, magazine world too, that this idea of like, you got to bust it out right away. And then your editor would tell you how you needed to spend more time editing it. <laughs> and you're like, but you gave me an hour. Um, so tell me a little bit more about that idea about mean editors. And specifically, I just want to know your thoughts on if editors or feedback needs to be mean to, or needs to be harsh to get you to where you want to go? Not all of my editors were mean, but um, the one that I probably learned the most from right out of school, um, my editor, Hugh, who uh, reports now at the White House um, for Playboy, but um, <laughs> But he used to be the editor of a small paper. Hey, Playboy um, pays well. I, worked. I wrote for Playboy yeah. before. It pays well. <laughs> it, I would love to be published in Playboy. It's not yeah. about the Playboy thing. It's. Um, I just love the and, idea that Playboy has a White House correspondent. Like that makes me really happy. <laughs> maybe not in Biden's administration. <laughs> right. Yeah, we'll see. yeah, it was more exciting. Uh. Um Oh, let me think. I feel like in the newsroom, when you had to get a publication out a daily, there wasn't time to be nice. Mm. But I really hope that I would have handled it differently than um, some of the editors I worked for. I really like the pace of working on a book and um, the slowness and that um, there's time for criticism to be well thought out. My husband, who is a, a journalist on daily stories he likes fast pace he does not his the idea of the worst kind of project for him would be working on a long piece so we don't see eye to eye um, on that but um, I think in the world of novels there's room for criticism to be kind and nurturing yeah but I don't know about journalism <laughs> I love that, that you talk about that time to be nurturing. I think that so many people put this like, it's interesting when I get people coming to sign up for write your freaking book already. I had a lot of people not sign up for it because they're like, this is a whole year. I don't have a year. I want my book out now. I'm going to write it in the next month. And I've checked back in with most of those people and they haven't written their book because we have this idea that a book is like a series of blog posts or a book is like a series of Instagram messages or a series of even journalistic essays. But I love that you brought up this idea that it's, it needs to be nurtured. And I want to know, as somebody who was stuck home nurturing kids during a pandemic, what nurturing your book looked like to you? Um, I think one of the most important things that you taught me was creating a creative space. I am a morning writer, but unfortunately, how my day is, that doesn't really allow for writing unless I'm willing to get up at four in the morning or something like that, which I'm not. So in the evening or whatever time I could feel, I would create my space. I would have a meditation and a candle and journal a little bit on paper to get the juices flowing and 
that seems really indulgent when you could always be doing laundry or dishes or some parent related thing. I could always be doing that. But I think maybe the the best part of this was just letting the dishes pile up and focus on myself because I hadn't allowed myself to do that in a long time. I am writing that down right there, letting the dishes pile up and focusing on myself. I think that's so hard, especially for women, especially for women with kids. Like they're told that they have to keep the house clean and the kids fed and the dishes done and everything and go after your dreams, honey. Like you go girl, you know, you have all of these messages and it can be so hard to clear that space out. And I love that you called it indulgent because even as a professional who went to school to be a writer and went to journalism and wants to write a book, it still can feel indulgent for you. I'm a professional writer. It still feels indulgent for me to take a day off to go write or an evening off to go write. Um, I live with my sister and my nieces and I feel so guilty that I don't get up in the morning and help with breakfast. Every morning I feel guilty. And every morning if I get up to go, they go, go back down, this is your time to write. So I'm lucky that I have that. And I would love to know how you, some of the ways in which you pushed through this idea that it's indulgent. Like, did you embrace the indulgence or do you have to remind yourself it's not indulgent? Like, how does that work for you? I think it started as feeling indulgent, but the deeper I got into it, I considered it more mental health and therapy, um, especially because some of the themes in my book deal with things that are going on in, in my life that I can't control. My mother has been diagnosed with early dementia and I can't control that. And a character in my book has early dementia and um, I can't control the racial injustices, the politics, I can't control the pandemic. I, I think it really boils down to an issue of control for me when it comes to mental health and when things feel like they're out of control, it helps me to write. And normally I would journal about my feelings, but writing this novel and some, doing something creative was felt indulgent at first, but I realized it was really um, saving me from just wallowing and falling into real depression, not just a, a sadness about what I couldn't fix, but um, a paralyzing depression. Mm. Oh, that's so beautiful. And I think so resonant with so many people. Writing is a way to get it out. And I've written many books that probably will never be published, but I wrote them because they were a way to heal. You know, I wrote a book about death. I wrote a book about grief. I wrote a book about being queer and a kid. And who knows if those books will ever come out in the world, but there's something really healing about just writing about someone else's life going through it instead of you. And I love that. And I love that your book brings in two aspects of your life. One, the early onset dementia and two, Switzerland. So I would love to talk, let's talk about maybe the dementia a little bit first and then go into Switzerland. If you're okay with that, I would love to know mm -hmm. what it felt like to create a character who's going through something similar to you yet is different than you. How did you deal with that separation in yourself and in your writing? Mm. Um, so something that I'm dealing with is um, the genetics of this kind of dementia and if I will develop the same. And so I didn't intentionally want that to come out in my character but as I wrote the dialogue um, that she was speaking with other people were all my fears about what happens if I get dementia and what does today mean if I'm going to have dementia how do I spend my time if it's if my life is shorter than I thought um, which is something all of us should explore anyway because you don't know what is ahead, um, but I, I I cried some days when I was writing. I um, I just wrote about all of my fears and 
they're still there, but um, I feel lighter somehow. Yeah. I remember, so full transparency, I'm on a high from, we just finished a weekend workshop where we got together in groups of three different books and myself and the other people in the group all read each other's books. And I read everybody's books and gave feedback and they read each other's books and we all got together and gave feedback. And all of us were just like, ah, <laughs> to, to Paige's book for multiple reasons. But one of the reasons that it really and we'll talk about the reasons why we're all sighing later because Switzerland, um, <laughs> the, the imagery in this book is so beautiful. But one of the reasons that it was such a profound book for me personally to read is I don't have dementia in my family, but I have four family members in my small family that have had cancer. And I lost years of my life from that fear of I'm going to get it too. Not lost years of my life, but I spent years of my life just wallowing in that fear after my brother died. And the questions that you raise in this book about just about immortality and about what it means to be like lovable as your immortal self and to be grieving immortality of the people that you love and of yourself. It was so universal and I think extra powerful because we're in a pandemic. And I have lung issues. So I'm like extra careful and afraid of this pandemic, like everyone is, right? And it just felt so, yes, it was talking about dementia and it was so specific to dementia too. And it felt so universal. So I, as somebody who has not had to deal with dementia, but really has had to deal with those questions, I love, love, love that. And it was so relatable. And so that part was really beautiful. And then I, I kind of hated you for the Switzerland part because it was really hard to be in COVID reading about these beautiful places and knowing I wasn't going to go there anytime soon. So um, tell me a little bit about why you decided. I mean, I can guess, but tell me why you decided to set half of this book in Switzerland. Um, I've fallen in love with Switzerland after living here for a few years. and. Um, I, I think it's really fun to write descriptions of Switzerland. I think it's beautiful in all seasons. Ob obviously, people think of the snow and skiing first, but um, it's beautiful in the summer. People swim in the lakes and rivers. The Swiss really protect their green space, and it shows. And um, I don't know how much longer we'll live here, and so I really needed to do some writing about it while we're here presently and um we haven't um really left the country um in a year i guess now and it's it's funny because i i would love to be in california and i get very homesick i haven't seen the ocean mm. in i don't know 18 months or something like that i'm in a long landlocked country um thinking about other places but yes it could be it could be worse well, I just love that like, I was like, oh, yeah, the grass is always greener on the other side of your quarantine pod. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. like, we're all just kind of stuck inside. Um, well, the way that you described Switzerland was amazing. And it is prob probably what's going to make, I mean, I, our whole team agreed that this book is going to go places. Like we see it in Reese Witherspoon book club pick. We see movies like going to go places. And I think one of the things that's going to help is that combination of like, the super indulgent, fantastical part in Switzerland and the like hard reality that's happening in California with the dementia. So it's just, I just love this book. I love it. I love it. So speaking of being stuck inside, I want to know like, how did, how did you write a book with kids? Like I can give advice. I live with two kids, so I can give some practical advice, but you have two young kids. How did that happen? How did that look for you? They are very needy and um, because they're one and three. So uh, I could not write at all while they were awake. And um, after they went to sleep, I wrote. I sacrificed Netflix and even connecting with my husband and um, just kind of being a couch potato. I had to buckle up and write, but I found that... Um, the more I wrote, the more energized I was by it, the more I was thinking all day, you know, what am I going to add tonight and taking little notes. 
on scraps of paper and um, not not a filing system that I recommend, but um, I also would send myself emails all day and it would just be novel notes number 42, novel notes number 43. And later on, sometimes they didn't make any sense, but um, you know, you get thoughts when you're at the park with your children or um, I don't know, one of them hits the other one and you, you think about something. Um, and I think that it's good to be open to inspiration everywhere. I think you just, you just taught me something. I hadn't thought about novel notes emails. Like I love that novel notes. I keep a note app, but I get them so confused. Like all my little notes. I like the idea that I just like send emails to myself about novel ideas. I, I really love that. In fact, it makes me want to write, it makes me want to create a whole email address where I just send novel ideas to. And then when I'm stuck, I can go look through that. Um, so you just taught me a tool and trick. So I'm grateful for that. Um, what is it like to, you said that you kind of had to sacrifice some time with your partner. How, what kind of negotiations did you two have to make to be able to write this book this year during this particular year too? Um, I remember reading James Smiley's book, 13 Ways of Looking at a Novel. And in the first chapter, maybe even the first paragraph, she says something like, you can't be married or have children if you're going to be a writer. But I was married and I have children and she ended up getting divorced and it was about sacrificing things for her craft and it scared the hell out of me when I read that because I would like to do both um luckily I'm married to a writer so he is understanding he doesn't think it's a silly hobby he thinks it's worthwhile he um he had been asking me for a while you know maybe you should talk to a therapist about this diagnosis with your mother and all these emotions that you're having. And, um, and I have been talking to a therapist too, but um, when I said, I want to write this novel and I think it will help me work through this heaviness that is around me, he was all for it. And um, he took our children out on a lot of weekends you know, three hour long trips to the park and that kind of thing. There's not much to do <laughs> during this pandemic, but um, he was very kind to make space for me because he knew it wasn't just, oh, maybe she'll publish a book or maybe she'll make some money or something like that. It was, this is, this is therapy. This is more important than, I, I don't know, more important than going to a spa and getting a massage. This is, this is really going to make our whole family happier. I love that you brought that up that this is so much more than money. Like, yes, I totally imagine your book, like Reese Witherspoon book club pick made into a movie. Like I can see it. And you wrote, I can see that because you put your heart and soul into this book. You put your grief into this book. You put your life experience in Switzerland into this book. You put fun amazing scenes about fondue that made me very hungry in this book. I can tell that you put yourself into this book. And I love that you just brought up that this wasn't about, yes, the eventual goal would be awesome to get it published. It wasn't, but it wasn't about selling. It was about telling. And I think that's what makes this book and this group of people in Wife Bus so powerful is that, you know, I, there were a lot, there were hundreds of people who applied and I took 10 this year um, we had to have someone who ended up at the end not making it because she it was COVID and she had to drop out. But so we had nine and every single one of you were just the stories you had to tell were so beautiful that I, I just wanted you in it. I just wanted to hear these stories. And so I love that you brought up that it was about telling these things and therapy and healing and all of that, because I can, I can tell that in your writing. And I think that makes it even more beautiful. I think you could have told this story otherwise. You're an amazing writer, um, even when you don't give yourself credit for that. But I think that it was also, you're an amazing writer because you allow yourself to heal through writing. And I think that that allows then me as the reader and hopefully the millions of readers who read it in the future um, to also heal as well through, with you. 
I guess my big question, as somebody who like coached you through this, you've been in writing situations for all of your life. Like, what was it this year, this program, this thing, this group that you feel took you to the next level so you were able to finally finish this book? I think, I mean, it's like writing a song, a love song while you're going through a breakup. Like I find inspiration in really dark times and hopeless times. I think a lot of people do that, you know, going through the dark soul of the night kind of thing. Um, But I'm not good about finishing projects and I'm, I struggle with confidence about my writing because I've had a lot of rejection, which is just, that's how it is in writing. I should know that by now, but I needed the support from the group and I needed you as my coach saying, you have a deadline. If you don't meet this deadline, you don't get to keep participating. You don't get to hear what everyone thinks of your book, all this time you put in. And I, I needed that to finish a book. I wish I had that amazing writer work ethic but I don't, I needed a coach. I love that because I, I, I meet so many people who are like, oh, I should just, I should just do it on my own. And I don't think we do anything on our own without some kind of consequence. Like everybody I know who's ever finished something, there's some consequence, some deadline, some, some like benefit if you get at the end. I think you need both consequences and benefits. So I love that you brought that up because one of the things I really wanted in Wifebo was hard, solid. If you do X, you get Y. If you don't do X, you don't get Y. And Y is really cool. So do X because I personally won't do anything unless there's a hard deadline and I get both a reward if I do it and a consequence if I don't. So I love that that works for you as well and the other people in the program. Um, I, I, yeah, I just think that it's, I think that it's a common misconception that it's a work work ethic thing. And I think it's about setting yourself up for success and success comes with actual deadlines because writing is, I feel like writing is literally just like a constant battle with procrastination. (laughs) It really is. You can do it later. You can do it later. You can do it later. Um, But when it's no longer time to wait till later, You need some hard deadlines. So I'm glad they worked. And I'm so glad that you hit those deadlines so we could give you something. In fact, I actually right here next to me still have the reward for you for um, finishing your first draft in time, but I can't send it to you because Switzerland and international shipping. But the next time you're able to be in California, I'll make sure you get it. And one of these days, I'll find a way to get it to you. But um, yeah, I'm super excited that those worked for you. Well, um, I would just, my final question for you is what's, what's next? What are you, what are you excited about next for your book? Where, what's the next step for you personally and in this, in this book writing process? Well, I love the feedback session, um, and getting to bounce ideas off, off of other people, other writers that got me really excited about the book because I could see the excitement in their faces. Well, maybe the character would do this, or maybe he would, you know, do this. And I I love that their minds kept going after the book ended about the characters as if they, they were real people. And so I'm really excited to put, to ruminate on their ideas and your ideas and put it into the fourth draft. And, um, we're on a break right now where we're not supposed to be writing. We're just supposed to be marinating in all of the critiques and all of the feedback. And I'm trying to just marinate in it. But this week I started drafting a second novel. I know that's yes. crazy. I need to finish the first, but no. um, it, it's picked off something. I love that. Oh my God, Paige, you hadn't told me that. That makes me mm. so excited because I think here's the thing you just opened a dam. Like every single mm-hmm. person I've talked to is like, that's cool. So we just workshop my book. It feels close to done. I'm I'm ready. I've had at least three of you come and tell me out of the six of a third of you have come and told me, and I'm sure the other ones have too, that, um, that you all are like, okay, cool. I'm ready for the second. I'm ready for another book. Mm-hmm. I'm ready for another book because, and this is what 
the write your freaking book already was a program I did for myself. I was like, okay, you have a year to write this book. What does that look like? I broke it down. I did it. I was like, cool, this works for me. And then I did it one-on-one with a bunch of people and it worked for them. So I was like, what would this look like in a group setting? And you all just keep proving that. And then once you prove you can write a book in a year, then it feels easier to write subsequent books. And maybe those books might take a year. Maybe those books might take five years, but it makes it so you have this step-by-step process that you know you can do. And you have the confidence now that you've done it, that you can do it. So I'm so, I cannot wait for a second book. Um, well, now I just want to ask you everything about the book, but I'll make, I'll stay on topic, Lauren, stay on topic. Uh, well, that's Not a sequel. Right. <laughs> that's awesome. I was going to say, I don't think it's a sequel. I figured it's a second. No. That's exciting. Um, I'm just way excited about this idea of a second book because it makes me so happy that one of the things Wifeba does, one of the things that I think, I hope School for Writers does in general is give permission, give people permission to call themselves writers and to be writers and to have writing in their life. And so it just makes me so happy that, that now there's another book too, like not just one book, but multiple books that are going to be out in the world. And that makes me super excited. And you said, I shouldn't be working on a second book, but you're, I gave you a deadline. So at, so people who aren't in the program, as much as I'm like, okay, you have to hit this deadline by this time. I also have forced breaks from your book so you can have a life and you can digest things and you can ruminate on things. So you're in a forced break from your first book, go write some of your second book, like have some fun with getting those down. I love it. Any last things that you want to share with our listeners, either about your book or about the Write Your Friggin' Book Already program that helped you get this book out? Any last minute things you feel like sharing with our listeners? I am encouraging all of my friends, especially my friends um, who were writers with me in college to sign up for Write Your Freaking Book Already because they haven't written the novel. We graduated college. 14 or 15 years ago now, and um, we're still thinking about the novel that we never wrote, and it was easier to write a novel than I thought. It's just that mountain that looks really tall, and you have to take the first step, but I needed the support group to do it. Well, I am so honored that you're telling other people and so glad that you were in this program because this book is so good to read. I loved reading it and I'm such a book nerd. So it makes me happy that I get to read your book and keep reading your book and keep supporting it being out in the world. So thank you for those kind words about the program and thank you for joining and for letting us pick your brain today about what it's like to write a book during a pandemic. If people it's want to fun. get, it's fun, right? <laughs> it was fun. We made it fun. I feel like Wifa was this really beautiful. It's such a great community that's drawn to this program in particular and like me and my quirkiness ways that I run it. And so I feel like it's just, it, it, Wifa makes writing a book fun. And that's, I think the best part about it all, because I think it can feel so lonely and boring otherwise, and really like overwhelming. I think your idea of like, it's a hill, it's a giant mountain and you don't know how you're going to get to the top. Well, you're going to get to the top with like a group of people helping you carry your pack and cheer you on and take, telling you what steps to take. So I love that. If people want to follow along Paige's journey, we'll include links to uh, Paige's blog and et cetera, et cetera, in the link show notes that you can get and see them. So I just want to say one last thank you, Paige. I appreciate so much having you on today. Thank you, Lauren. I owe you my novel. I'm (laughs) super excited to buy a copy for every person I know. So yay, go team. And with that, I will say goodbye for today, but I will see you, Paige, soon. And I will talk to all you listeners next week. Thank you. Bye. Bye. This week's book recommendation continues the theme of romance and love that I have throughout February because y'all, I'm a huge fan of romance. I'm a huge fan of romance because I like love. I love love. It's so great. I'm a romantic at heart. I write romance. I love romance. But also because romance is often looked down upon in our society. And I feel like that has to do with the patriarchy. But I also feel like it has to do with we pigeonhole all romance together. But romance is this beautiful wide genre. And there's so much diversity and beauty and joy that comes in a happily ever after. To continue our theme of love stories, we're going to talk about... 
The seven husbands of Evelyn Hugo. Y'all, seven different husbands. I love this book. I love this book. I love this book so much. This is how great this book is. My sister, she hates romance and she loved this book. And I wouldn't necessarily call it romance, although it is romance. I don't know if you would like put it, find it in the romance section of the bookstore, but you can find it in the bestseller section of the bookstore because it's been a huge hit. But what I love about it is it explores the beauty and the glamour and you just get completely lost in old timey Hollywood. Just Evelyn Hugo is a famous movie star. She's an in her older age and she's giving her memoir stories to a journalist and you are reliving her life with her as she tells it to the journalist. And there's queer characters in it, which makes me so happy. As y'all know, I love me some queer stories. And there's glamour and there's romance. And there's just, it's a beautiful, beautiful book to escape to. And we could all use some escapism right now. So if you want to escape into seven different relationships, and seven different versions of love, and one ultimate love of her life as well, I highly suggest The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo by Taylor Jenkins Reid. And if you haven't already read the Daisy Jones and the Six, also by Taylor Jenkins Reid, I suggest just buying them both together because they're amazing. When you go to buy your books, both of her books, The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo and Daisy Jones and the Six, both by Taylor Jenkins Reid, I highly, highly, highly suggest going to bookshop.org and finding a local independent bookstore. The greatest way to support diversity in bookshelves is to support independent small bookstores. Get your books from somewhere other than Amazon. Please, please, please. It really helps us get diverse voices out there. Amazon only shows you what's already popular, whereas independent bookstores show you they foster community and support. So support your local independent bookstore and get yourself a copy of The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo by Taylor Jenkins Reid. I never will, I never will.